Welcome, Dr. Morse. It's great to be talking to you today. Hi, Matt. So I want to take a moment to get the facts straight about COVID and long COVID. So first off, what is long COVID? I'm glad you asked the question. There's a lot of controversy actually about this. And um, to make it you know, as simple and as plain as I can, long COVID is really um, any symptoms that last beyond about three months or so after uh, someone has had an infection with COVID in the acute phase. And those symptoms can really be quite wide ranging and can impact just about any part of the body. Um, so some of the more common symptoms that we hear about are um, fatigue. We also hear about mood symptoms, sometimes depression or anxiety. We hear about exercise tolerance, muscle pains, um, and several other symptoms. And although there isn't a specific laboratory test that tells us yes or no that someone has long COVID, we are very used to in medicine really a, a group of symptoms being enough to say this uh, person uh, or this uh, individual has what we would classify as long COVID. I do expect, however, that the definition will continue to be uh, researched and clarified even further over the coming months and years. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I remember myself being shocked to learn initially that there's uh, over 200 potential symptoms for people uh, who have um, long COVID. And in some ways, on this side of it also makes it hard uh, to figure it out because so many people's experiences are different, right? Yes, this is something that I hope will not be true for forever. But at this time, we don't really have a clinical or laboratory test that allows us to easily say yes or no, that someone does or does not have long COVID. Now, that might make it a little difficult for now, but what we do know is that the symptoms of long COVID, you know, symptoms that last uh, beyond three months after an infection, um, are very, very common. Um, sometimes what happens, however, is that someone might be experiencing some of the symptoms and not really realize that it was related to uh, a COVID infection that they had some time ago. And so it is really important to talk to your provider if you are having symptoms. And there are a number of symptoms, uh, as was mentioned, almost 200 possible symptoms related to long COVID. And so we do really encourage those conversations with providers. And the final thing I will say is that our data here in New York City suggests that there are about, uh, about one in three New Yorkers uh, say that they've had symptoms that have lasted longer than a month after their COVID infection. So um, we know that uh, having symptoms is very common. Yeah, thank you for that. Would you be able to explain to me what we now know about how the virus spreads from one person to another? Absolutely. Another incredibly important point. And I'm glad we're talking about this because as someone in public health, it's so important that the public have really reliable information about this. What we know about COVID is that it is spread by aerosolized droplets. So these are, you know, droplets that fly through the air. Uh, if you're ever on the subway and someone sneezes on you or uh, coughs on you and they're not wearing a mask or you're not wearing a mask, those kind of droplets, um, aerosolized droplets, um, which are kind of tiny little, tiny little water particles that have virus in them, uh, can go just about anywhere um, and they travel very quickly. Um, and that is the main route um, that COVID is spread. And those little tiny, tiny droplets can land, you know, anywhere uh, and are easily inhaled, frankly. Um, and that's really how transmission happens as far as we are aware. It, it took me until about a year ago to really understand what it means for COVID to be airborne, right? Um, and I know initially we thought that it was on these heavier droplets, right? This is where the social distancing came from, that they would come and fall they would come out of your mouth and fall down about six feet apart, which is where that came from. But now that we know that it's in the aerosol, it's essentially, it moves like smoke, right? So it moves over these longer distances and um, it can stay in a room suspended in the air if there's not ventilation or the air clean. So I think that was really helpful for me and also understanding why, for example, I wanna wear a mask that seals to my face um, because, for example, if I'm in a room filled with smoke, if I have a mask that gaps in it, it's going to be going in all those different places. Um, yeah, but I'd love to hear a bit about, uh, you know, the recommendations for how we should be containing the spread of COVID. 
Absolutely, and I think your, your analogy is, is very, very clear and well said, so I'm glad you shared that one. Um, there are a, a number of ways that we can protect ourselves and our loved ones from COVID. And um, you know, in some ways, uh, our guidance hasn't changed too significantly um, on how to do that. Um, first and foremost, uh, wearing a mask that fits well to your face, particularly when you're in crowded places, um, is one way to protect yourself against the spread of COVID and to protect the people around you. That's even more important if you have a condition that might make your immune system more vulnerable or other conditions that would make it um, even more uh, concerning were you to get COVID, so chronic diseases and other, uh, other things. And we also continue to encourage people to get an up-to-date COVID vaccine. Um, the vaccine prevents um, complications from COVID, especially hospitalization or even death. And the vaccine also decreases your chances of long COVID. So those are really meaningful, clear, um, and safe uh, and effective data that we have about the importance of the COVID vaccine. And the staying home when you're sick, and that can be hard to do, um, particularly if you have a really busy life or a job that doesn't really give you a lot of flexibility. And yet it's one of the ways to really uh, prevent the spread of not only COVID, uh, which is our topic for today, but also for RSV and flu and lots of other viruses. So we do continue uh, to encourage people to stay home when they're sick as well. Thank you for that. I think for me, for a long time, I thought, you know, really the main, either you have a very severe outcome, right, like hospitalization or death, or you're fine. And uh, it took me a long time to learn um, and the pain, and the painful way of learning it that the much greater, more likely option actually is long COVID. So can you talk a bit about the cumulative risk of long COVID for people who contract the virus multiple times? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I, I would say that we are still um, discovering some of those cumulative risks where um, there is a lot of research happening across the country and the world about what are the risk factors for long COVID. Um, and we also do know, however, that it is incredibly common. In fact, um, the survey that we recently completed in New York City showed that about a third of New Yorkers who had COVID had symptoms for at least a month after COVID. Now that doesn't uh, qualify exactly as long COVID, but it does tell us that there are impacts of this virus. Um, we also know, of course, that COVID impacts your blood vessels and makes them fragile. Um, and so there's also increased risk of cardiovascular diseases and, um, and others. And so we are still, I would say, um, clarifying and quantifying the impacts of COVID and, and just how long-term those impacts can be. Um, but we're very, very excited here in New York City also to be doing a study right now um, uh, that enrolled several thousand patients who had COVID and is monitoring their symptoms over time and trying to find associations, kind of what are the things that lead to those complications. Um, and uh, we will have a better sense of how many times uh, those folks have also had COVID and what that might be associated with. So I would say more to come, um, but again, we encourage everyone to use the measures I just described, you know, wearing masks, staying out of crowded places, um, getting an up-to-date COVID vaccine, staying home when you're sick, washing your hands. These are all things that the public can do right now to prevent uh, you know, reinfection with COVID. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you sharing those that information. And I guess one thing even that comes to mind for me too, right, is the, the ventilation, right, of the spaces and cleaning the air, right? Because, it's, because it can hang in the air, right? We want to be able to move that through. So opening windows can be really helpful. Even pointing a fan out the window can help get the air out of the space. HEPA filters, you can even make your own with a box fan, taping it to a, you know, a HEPA filter, um, you know, cause it's cold in New York city right now, as I know. <laughs> um, That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I really appreciate all that. Um, and you know, one of the Great things about vaccines also, it's, it's probably one of the easiest precautions that you can take, right? Because you can do it once every once in a while, and then you don't have to think about it again. Um, I'm curious, how long does the immunity from the COVID vaccines last? Um, and why is it important to keep getting vaccinated? Absolutely. 
That is such an important question. And one of the things that we know, of course, is that the COVID virus continues to sh change shape and, and change form. And because of that, um, our strong recommendation is that you know everyone um, get a vaccine, an updated vaccine every fall. And for some people, you know, that uh, annual COVID vaccine is going to be solid and really protect them. Um, for other people, um, their immune system may need them to have the vaccine a little bit more often than that. Um, and for folks who are older, above 65, um, for folks who are, uh, you know, have a, a disease that might compromise their immune system, and a few other classes of people, including those who've, who have had transplants, um, we do recommend that they have the COVID vaccine slightly more often than that. Um, and the best way to figure out what the right frequency is for you is really to talk to your provider and, you know, talk through what your risk, your specific risks are your specific concerns are and your provider or your physician or nurse practitioner will be able to tell you what is the best frequency for your COVID vaccine. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the most compelling reasons for people to consider getting the vaccine is that it lowers the risk of long COVID, right? I have all the vaccines that I could possibly have and I still have long COVID, but I'm also very aware that my long COVID could be worse um, if I did not have the vaccines, right? Sort of the analogy that I'm thinking of is, you know, it's like wearing a seatbelt in a car, right? That doesn't mean that you won't experience injury in a car crash or death, right? And if you do, that doesn't mean that seatbelts don't work. It means that they are one part of a tool for um, effectively protecting yourself. That's so well said, Matt. Thank you. I'm going to use that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I spent a, a lot one. of time thinking about these things. <laughs> That's a really good one. Thank you. Very well said. That's Thank exactly you. right. I appreciate that. Yeah. And and I guess uh, to continue with it a little more, if you like it, um, yes. you know, I, I think I tend to think of masks for me as like the breaks, right? So mm. um, the mask prevents the sort of exposure, right? If it's a well-fitted mask um, and then the vaccines lower the uh, the impact like a seatbelt does. Um, and so all those things together, the layered precautions is, is really the best way we know, right. To, uh, prevent infection and to lower the risk of long COVID. Um, but taking some precautions is better than taking no precautions. And from what you've been saying about long COVID and, and the risk of it, um, it seems like it's worth it for people to invest in protecting their self, themselves to some degree. Is that right? A hundred percent. I think everything you described is a hundred percent spot on. The more of these measures you put together, the safer you're going to be. And I think that's a hundred percent right that, you know, if you put together the mask, the vaccine, the hand washing, the staying home when you're sick, you are really putting yourself in the best possible scenario um, and in your, you know, best possible state of health and, and lowest risk. And that protects you as well as all the people around you, the people you live with in your community. Right, so important. Thank you so much, I appreciate your insight. Thank you so much, Matt.